Uh, first question, um, inspired by your remarks to Carl, you said uh, that we can't just drift, but we must design. And um, you spent some time talking about uh, the three big crises in, in Europe's near abroad. Uh, could you give us a sense of what you think uh, a European security strategy should look like, given that it's been 10 years since one was formally uh, drafted? And would you think that Europe is now uh, in a position to attempt, to coin a, a German phrase, another gesamt concept of this kind, to give, uh, a, a provide a strategy behind that larger European voice of which you are such a proud champion? That's a good question, which I don't think has a good answer as of yet. Um, I mean, one of the big differences, of course, between sort of NATO and EU is that in, in NATO you have, sorry to say, you have a dominant power. And the strategic vision is to a large extent driven by that dominant power. And of course, the members of NATO are there because they want to align themselves for their own security reasons with that dominant power. Europe isn't like that. Europe has been is composed of nations who have been fighting wars against each other. The strategic outlook of the different European nations are very different. I mean, the strategic outlook of Sweden and Portugal are not identical for obvious reasons. We look at different parts of the world and we have different historical experiences. So merging this together into some sort of strategic concept is not going to happen over day. Uh, we, uh, one of the things that we are driving at the moment is that we are saying inside the Union that we have a strategic document that was decided in 2003. It's not a bad document, but it's not relevant any longer. Let's see if we can sit together, the European governments, and see if we can align our strategic outlooks and cultures somewhat more. We do it to a certain extent by operations, actions, by events, dear boy, events. But see if we can do it somewhat more conceptually. And what we have seen, I think we have now I forgot the figure, but we have, I think we have 17,000 people in operations all over the world. It's more than people are aware of. Those are primarily civilian military, civilian security more than military operations of different sort, be that in Somalia, be that in Mali, be that in the Gulf of Aden, uh, be that in the Balkans. And this is gradually coming together. But we have on the agenda for the European Council in December, we have defense, which is not a sort of where sort of the, we don't want to sort of duplicate anything that's done in NATO, that would be useless and senseless, but there are things that we need to do together. Uh, we are developing policy, I mentioned the Eastern Partnership, I mentioned stabilization in the Balkans, uh, I, the neighborhood of the neighborhoods I think is going to be a big issue for Europe, which means the Sahel, de facto, uh, who's going to help the Sahel region to achieve stability, no one except us. And if Sahel is not more or less stable, then the southern littoral of the Mediterranean is not stable, and that interacts directly into our societies. So I, I, I think we, it is work, work in progress. It is far better than it was a couple of years ago, but it's still a question of within an organization where no power is dominant, where there are different views on things like the use of military force, where geographic priorities are different, where historical experiences are different, coming together. But taking that into account, we are not doing that badly. And I, I, I just think I need to ask uh, uh, Espen, uh, coming from Oslo and having spent so much time recently in, in Israel and the, and the West Bank, could you define a little bit more precisely the sources of your um, optimism about uh, whether this nine-month period won't turn into another nine-month period, into another nine-month period, and this last chance that's been advertised for 19 and a half the last 20 years is still not seized? What, what are the real sources of your optimism? Yep, I, I, um, I should qualify the word optimism, because I think, I, I think empirically this is the last chance. That could be optimist or pessimist. Uh, so I'll start by why, why do I think it's the last chance? Well, I think first I think it, 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 the, the Palestinian state building project is fundamental to any political solution, because if that collapses there is no chance for a political horizon, because the institution building was supposed all back in Oslo, it's actually September 93, so it's exactly 20, year, 20 years, I think last Friday. Um, the the um, 
the, the whole idea was that we should try to invest in building the institutions of a Palestinian state so it would be ready when the political feature of a, political, of a Palestinian state would be there. And the donors are simply getting extremely tired. We, we, we have the um, America, we have a number of Europeans, a number of Europeans who, of course, themselves have serious economic troubles in keeping up the level. And we have a number of important Arab donors who are increasingly telling us, and me as the chair, that you know, we are wondering whether, whether what we are actually doing is funding the Israeli occupation. We're not going to do that any longer, but we'll give it this chance. So, I mean, the, the, the thing will, could be evaporate from the outside. On the inside, the, you know, the, the, there has been for many years a sense, obviously in Gaza for very obvious reasons, but also in the West Bank, that sort of the younger part of the Palestinian population have been asking, why are these, these old guard continue to do this? It's not going to lead anywhere. And, and, and how long should we trust these people or should we do something completely different? But as long as there has been a belief from donors and from key Palestinians, including that everything from the street policemen who've been making his services, working with, working with uh, actually with Israeli intelligence to capture other Palestinian uh, terrorists and so on, up to the leadership, they are you know, increasingly tired of the whole thing and that could, that could lead to a breakdown. Why there is, so that I think is an empirical fact. I don't think we can continue after this because if this time works, people will say exactly how do we know it doesn't work uh, afterwards. The alternative, there are alternatives. There is the alternative called the one state solution. Um, but the problem is that every time you raise the issue of one state solution, then Israel remembers why it wants a two state solution. Because it's very easy to calculate that uh, that one state solution called Israel would, incre would be increasingly dominated by Arabs and the Jewish character of the state will be questioned. And Israel would have to make a choice between actually remaining democratic and allowing Jews to become a minority, or to make some kind of dual-level citizenship, which some bad, uh, you know, with, with a bad word would be called uh, apartheid. So, I mean, it's actually a strategic challenge for both sides, and I think that this reality is beginning to grow, to to dawn on some players. And and I think with the with the commitment from Kerry, supported by Obama, the international attempt to support this is an argument that it could help this time. Also, the strategic environment that they actually, there, there have been certain developments. For instance, the clear weakening of Hamas has made the, the sort of the Ramallah government more credible in the eyes of Palestinians. That's also a moment that should be, should be, be reaped. I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm just saying we have to work hard to see if it can work this time. Otherwise, we will have to really think outside the box and reframe the paradigm. And the Oslo approach will probably not last any longer. I'll just take a couple. There's uh, others, but we'll just take two points, and then we'll, we'll have dinner. John Louis Jagan first. I would like to ask to the two ministers uh, a question on Syria. Why the two, uh, Sweden and Norway and other Nordic countries, have a long tradition of being very active uh, for peace missions or humanitarian actions, are not more proactive to propose concrete solutions to implement an immediate, even partial ceasefire in Syria, because nobody is really taking care of that, you know. Uh, uh, the Americans and the, uh, the French and the British are preoccupied with the control of the chemical weapons. The Russians are basically hoping that Bashar will, will win the war. And, uh, and the slaughter is continuing and in worsening every day. So is, uh, I believe that uh, Nordic countries are very well prepared to make some concrete proposal uh, safe, uh, safe areas, uh, partial ceasefire, humanitarian uh, uh, actions, but something has to be done. Otherwise, if we have to wait and for, for the first of Geneva meeting, we may wait weeks and months and with tens of thousands of more Syrians being slaughtered. Carl? Good, um, good remark. Now, what, what are we doing? I mean, first, let's not forget the fact that we are we're extremely large in humanitarian aid. Uh, that sort of, I, I think we are, Sweden I think is the number four in the world when it comes to Syria, I think Norway would be in the same, mm -hmm. same league. That, that's fairly obvious, that has always been the case. We have a particular situation in this country in that we've got a very significant Syrian community in this country. Uh, I mean, there's a larger Syrian community in Sweden than anywhere else in Europe. They've been here for quite some time. Uh, they are primarily Christians, but not only Christians. So the human links that we have right into Syria and the knowledge of what's happening is perhaps fairly profound. That doesn't make things easier, has to be said, because the complexity of the situation is obvious to us. What have been 
we've been trying to do. We've been trying to help the opposition in different ways, uh, with all sorts of advices and technical and whatever, to try to get them to act somewhat more coherently together. I wouldn't necessarily call that a smashing success, but still something. And I think it's absolutely essential also in order to get a negotiated outcome. Then I've been very strong in supporting uh, first Kofi Annan and then Lakta Brahimi. And the approach that they have taken, I think, is the only one that has any hope of bringing some sort of success. Add to that, we've been trying to get the Security Council, this sort of diverse body sitting in New York that you might have heard of, um, which can't unite on anything, that they should at least be able to get together on a resolution on the importance of international humanitarian law. Because what we've seen is a deterioration from all sides in Syria on the respect for international humanitarian law. And at least this is an issue where I think the Americans, the French, the Russians, the Iranians, everyone should have a common interest. And I think with this pursued primarily through Luxembourg and Australia, by the way, who are there at the moment, we were on the verge of success of that when August 21st happened. Mm. And then, of course, what we did there, I mean, sort of the head of the UN inspection team was coming from our organizations. Our laboratories have been heavily involved in, in the work, and we are now seeing what we can do in order to help in that particular effort. So, piecemeal, yes. Have we proposed any grand solutions? No. And one of the reasons for that, uh, personal experience, I was involved in a lot of the Balkan stuff, trying to make peace there. Um, what I learned among the things is that if there's one appointed by the international community to try to get the parties to achieve peace, the rest should stay away and not try to undercut and disturb yeah. that particular process. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if we have united on one person to try to do it, stay away from it and support him until you replace him. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first, I, I completely echo what uh, what Carl said. I mean, we are we, we are really trying to do what we can. I mean, we have been we're taking the initiative on humanitarian respect for humanitarian law. We're working together with the International Red Cross, with with Russia, with parties, with the opposition, trying to find channels to, to basically to say that even if you're in war, there are certain rules that apply. And, and in this war, nobody respects anything. They keep bombing hospitals and ambulances and, and, and killing people from all sides. And there are many sides, not two sides, there are many sides. Uh, we also had uh, an initiative very early after the uh, Obama uh, speech that he had decided himself that he wanted the Congress support, uh, which uh, at least de facto created some time for diplomacy. We came up with, we were early when in coming up with some ideas along this sort of specific chemical weapons uh, uh, path referring to the OPC, WTU, and so on. And we've been working to try to get the opposition more united, as Carl said. But I think it's a very important point, what Carl said at the end, I really want to spell out. If experience from the Balkans and so many other conflicts is that as long as the international community is divided, that's a problem in itself. The division in the international community obviously does not create a, an action, that's clear. That everybody understands that if you disagree, you're not taking composition. But it's worse than that. It's much worse than that because the division in itself has a material negative effect because it tells people in the conflict that they have some friends out there. Everybody has a friend out there. And, and, and what we know from hard experience is that in order to create an approach that can lead to peace, you need the parties to have some kind of realistic understanding of what their chances are on the battlefield. You know, a mutually hurting stalemate is the, is the most sort of um, enabling circumstance for peace negotiations. If, you, if I think that next week I'm going to win the war, why would I want to go to a conference to make a comp have a compromise? And, and, and to be very frank, if we keep speaking about delivering weapons which we don't deliver, or if we keep speaking as if we were about to bomb and then not bomb, that what it does is to create a very severe false impression on the side of the actors in the field that they, you know, they are about to get them help. And, and, and to be very, you know, it, I think it's rather obvious that to be a guerrilla with the US Air Force on your side is quite different from being a guerrilla without the US Air Force uh, on your side. And if, if you're not certain on where you stand between these two options, you will not make the right choices. So I think 
it's a very cynical statement, but it's a statement in favor of peace. If what's happened over the last weeks is a reality check to the limits of international intervention, that can actually be good, because it can actually provide the circumstance where some kind of talks can start. Until now, it's been a, a, absolutely and utterly impossible to get significant representatives of the opposition to come to any kind of peace negotiation. And we're very honest, those are the people who didn't want to come. And it's, humanly speaking, perfectly understandable. We want to throw out the dictator, we want to win, and we just go on a little bit more and the West will come and help us. It doesn't. And I think, as, I think some honesty on that is actually helpful. And this is based on uh, experience that Carl and I both been involved in, in different roles in the Balkans. It was when, when people got that right that we were, we were starting to approach some kind of a real uh, circumstance. And there were proposals in the early 90s how to fix the Bosnia war. Then 100,000 people at least were killed or 80, 90,000 people were, more were killed, and, uh, and the Dayton Agreement was very resembling of the early proposals, but there was more realism that had been introduced uh, underway. I'll take one more, Wolfgang Dasbrucker, and then we'll, we'll close with that. I think uh, there, I know that there are others. We'll see. Uh, if, if you ask a very quick question now, I'll get you to Michel as well. Wolfgang, never. Wolfgang, we can, I know. We can well, it. actually, I wanted to thank you very much, and I wanted to go right straight back to you, uh, John, because you raised the notion of uh, more strategic long-term thinking. And I was reminded of Sir Michael Howard, and I was reminded of, as Carl so rightly said, uh, that this is on the top of uh, the world, on the top of Europe. Um, nobody mentioned the notion of um, non-state actors or powerful individual actors like Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates who changed the world in a situation where we have individual empowerment. We all speak about cybersecurity. It's individual empowerment. 11-year-olds can change the world. And since, I can say this is a Central European American, Liechtensteiner, mm -hmm. since Scandinavia has always been, especially Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, on the avant-garde of thinking, on the avant-garde of industry, why don't we begin being on the avant-garde of the new strategic thinking? Yusuf Michel, if you stand up, then the microphone will go. There you go. Yes, there you go. Thank you. Uh, Yusuf Michel from Bahrain. Um, Carl, you've, you've said two things that are really uh, opposite. You're saying mm -hmm. light intervention, then you're saying Geneva 2, 3, 4, 5, and go on. Are you with both of them together? <laughs> Shall we go for light intervention and then go for Geneva 2, 3, 4, 5? Uh, shall the military option still continue to be there? Sir, from Mr. Edi, you've said something on the younger generation in Palestine are not going to keep waiting for longer. Will uh, you and the committee with the Oslo, would you be supporting a kind of like an Arab, uh, uh, Arab rising, uprising in the Palestinian Authority area to remove the old regime <laughs> and start going with a new one that can really communicate better with the ever-changing Israeli government all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Espen first, then Carl. Uh, good question. I am um, pro-democracy, so I think uh, people should occasionally have a chance to vote, and I think uh, uh, voting is better than... Uh, it's preferable to sort of uh, violent clashes in the streets, if you, if you can choose that. And I think there will be a time where there is a need for a, you know, a, a renewed mandate for the Palestinian leadership. But right now, I think the focus is trying to make this round happen. And we're trying, and I really want to underline, and without spending much time on that, there's a lot that is, there's a lot of ideas now on the economic front. How to have private sector investment, how to transform the Palestinian economy, which is not bad. I mean, it, 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 we always, there's a lot to complain about and a lot to criticize them about, but the Palestinian state capacity is actually on average or better than many states in the region. It's actually quite impressive, but it's very public. It's a public sector driven, and we want to try to stimulate some more private activities across, you know, in Palestine, but also with 
those Israelis who want to, and, and we have some concrete ideas about uh, a gradual lifting of restrictions in what's called, referred to as Area C, which is an important part of the occupied territories. And these ideas are, these ideas can help given that there is a political progress, but they will have no purpose if the political progress is not happening. So we're trying to build a kind of triangular relationship between the state building effort, the private sector activities, which also uh, Tony Blair is very active on in his role as courted representative and, and the political uh, horizon that uh, the parties and Kerry are trying to, to develop. So, so that's my answer to that. But to the first question, I, you're absolutely right. And I mean, you know, we, we, we could go on longer and we should talk about individuals and absolutely right in that. I just want to say that we are very much engaged with some of these people. Norway works intensively with the Bill Gates and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as one of many of these private actors. And one of the most interesting developments in the UN, which the UN really should be commended for, is that they've been able to develop a new idea of partnerships where you go from very formalistic decision-making among a lot of states to actually saying, just do it. I mean, if the purpose is to promote you know, girls' education in, in certain countries, we just go out and do it, or, 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 or vaccine to, to, to kids in, in, in developing countries, just do it. It's a, it's a partnership approach, which very much is lining up private business, philanthropists, institutions like the World Health Organization or UNESCO with the UN and with the Secretary General, more as a convener. And this is something we, from our side, has been very, have been very supportive of developing because there is a lot that can be done uh, that does not require the very more formalistic approach of more traditional international relations. We need both, but there is a new balance, and you're absolutely right in pointing that out. Oh. Well, interventions are difficult. I, 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 I mentioned the concept of light intervention with a certain amount of reluctance, because even if there are cases where it, you could argue it has worked, and I could have added, I, I think I should have added Mali, as a matter of fact, uh, because the number of forces involved in Mali was a couple of thousand or whatever, 4,000, and, and fairly quickly, and most of them are gone now and replaced. Chad was another where Sweden was involved. We Actually, I have to say that Chad is not a traditional area of deployment for the Swedish armed forces, and we sent our amphibious forces into the Sahara, which was a novel experience, but, but it did work. Uh, Chad is now sort of by the standards of the place. Fairly okay. Um, but these are sort of, they can easily go wrong. Syria is not a place for light intervention. And um, I don't, I, I'm known as fairly skeptical concerning the belief popular in the US debate, fixed thing with air power. I've, I've, I've seen that, I've seen the deployment or several times in the Balkans. I've, I've seen it on television, it looks great. I've seen it in reality, and I distinct limitations. And at the end of the day, you have to be there on the ground. You can't be in the sky. You have to be on the ground. And then back to Syria, as I said. I don't see any army in sight that is ready outside, that is ready to go in and stabilize. No one is ready. Iraq, forces that are going to be necessary, enormous, they will have to stay there for decades in order to the work. The only army nearby, the Turkish one, and open the history books, and you can understand that that is not obviously an option. Accordingly, the only option that is there is the diplomatic one, trying to get the fighting forces that are now there, not all of them, because some of them will need to be confronted with, obviously, for some time to come, but get the others, the reasonable ones, whoever those are, to get together and stabilize their country. That is an enormously difficult option, and you can all see the problems associated with it, but I fail to see the alternative. If you look at a place like Syria, 20 million people, I think 20 times the size of... I, mean, I, I compared with Kosovo once when I was in discussion. I think it is uh, 20 times the population and 30 times the size. And I think for the stabilization of Kosovo, we had... 30,000? 42,000. 42,000? 42, I mean, you can make the numbers out of that. And, and, and you see that that is simply not an option. And since that option is not there, you are there with the diplomatic option. And in order to have the diplomatic option work, then I back to what Espinosa said, we need to come together 
If the international community is divided, they will continue to fight forever. Politics is not always the easy choices. Politics is really about the difficult choices, and certainly we are facing those in Syria. Espen, you just want to add something? Just a very short point to underline our, our shared point of, of the importance of unity. I mean, the whole Balkan story that we described this was going from severe disunity to gradual unity. And, and we were fearing for 10 years that maybe the worst conflict would come in Macedonia, which it didn't. They have their problems, but the, the, the war didn't come. When we were on the brink of war in 2001 in Macedonia after Kosovo, the international community actually, were actually able to come up with one message. We agreed on saying the following, very simple, to the Albanians, we are not going to accept any kind of succession. Forget about it. To the Macedonian majority, you have to respect the rights of the Albanians. And this is our message. It was for everyone. And, 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 and I actually think that had a material effect on what happened later. So the, the importance of unity, there are examples that when you're able to come up with one message, it, it doesn't fix the problem overnight, but it, it shapes people's behavior in the opposite direction if, as if everybody's all over the place. And, and parties who are desperately fighting a war, they will always listen to the people who say the things they like uh, and not the things they don't like because they're, they, they're searching for hope. It's for perfectly understandable, but it means there's a political responsibility of, of being serious and not using other people's dying as you know, some kind of uh, scenario for demonstrating a will that isn't really there. Since um, Carl mentioned air power, I must repeat the famous uh, epigrammatic phrase of uh, Eliot Cohen, which is that air power is the equivalent of modern courtship. It offers instant gratification with no sense of commitment. <laughs> We, to use it. We've, had, uh, <laughs> we've had on stage for the last hour and 15 minutes uh, two political leaders who think strategically, act pragmatically. I think all of the ISS membership understand why we chose to be here in Sweden and here in Norway, if I can adopt the Nordic posture, uh, to host the Global Strategic Review. Thank you both for supporting us in this endeavor, and thank you both for having introduced a genuinely strategic discussion tonight.